thanks everyone for uh, sticking around. Um, I know it's kind of a long day of, of sitting on, on Zoom, Zoom presentations, but I uh, appreciate everyone sticking around. This is the fifth of five days um, of our bank webinar series. Um, and typically, what, you know, if this was a live presentation and this was the last you know, breakout session, I would be the last person be, you know, between you and the, in the social hour where, where we can enjoy refre refreshments and, and uh, some heavy hors d'oeuvres and things like that and have some socializing. But uh, lucky for us this year, you know, we get to just go back to work after this presentation, <laughs> being a little sarcastic there, but uh, appreciate everyone sticking around. And uh, just looking at our at our theme this year, Uncharted, you know that can take on a number of meanings. Um, you know, first of all, is the obvious one with with COVID, you know, and the new you know working environment that, that we're working in. You know, what people working from home, and and you listen to some of the regulators in the previous panel talk about how how they're conducting examinations offsite uh, electronically. Everyone's working from home, things of that nature. Same thing in the audit world for us. Um, but it also, there's also some other uncharted territories too that um, the pandemic has kind of spurred. And, and one of them is the significant growth that a lot of banks are experiencing in, that have experienced in 2020, uh, pushing them close to you know, dollar asset thresholds that they previously weren't anticipating to reach um, in, at this time. So they, you know, in, in particular, approaching the $1 billion ash asset threshold. And so that is what I'm going to talk about today is, um, you know, the FDIC part 363 um, threshold for approaching $1 billion. And what, what does that mean to your bank? And, you know, what, ca what caused this growth? Um, there are a number of, number of reasons, um, you know, as you can, and it, it hasn't just been 2020, but over, you know, the last, you know, several years of, there has been a, you know, what you would call a, a deconsolidation of, of banks across the nation. Um, if you remember, if you attended our discussion on October 7th, when we had an M&A panel um, and some discussion there, there was a chart there that showed the number of uh, bank charters and the trend from 2011 through 2020, and the number of banks have decreased by 30% over that period. And also on that chart, it indicated that average assets have increased by 123%, so more than doubled um, over the last 10 years. So what does that mean? That means that you know banks are getting bigger on average, and and so you're starting to see a lot more banks approaching you know not only the 500 million dollar in total asset benchmark, uh, but also that 1 billion dollar total asset benchmark you know that the FDIC has laid out in its Part 363 rules. You know, and another thing driving that. That increase, as you know, as Brett mentioned in in his presentation, you know, the just the significant deposit growth. So you know, the primary driver, you know, of bank growth comes from deposits. So that increased deposits, um, you know, along with some of the other stimulus, has really pushed uh, the envelope for some of these banks. So so they're starting to think about Fidesha and what does that mean to their bank. So just a little background on you know where did, where did Fidesha come from. You know, it really stemmed back from, if you went back to the 1980s, um, and I remember in the 1980s, I, I grew up in the 80s, but I wasn't really thinking about um, the FDIC um, or anything in the banking sector. So, um, you, you know, I hear a lot at other conferences and other banking seminars, usually there's a discussion about, you know, back, you know, remembering back in the 1980s and the, and the egg crisis um, and the savings and loan crisis and things like that. So just doing a little bit of research on, on the history of that, you know, that's kind of where Fidesha kind of came into play was um, as a result of that savings and loan crisis um, in the 1980s, you know, where you saw nearly 1300 banks, you know, fail um, during that time period. So in 1991, the response to that was the creation of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation Improvement Act or Fidesha or Fidusha or Fidesha. Uh, there's a number of ways to say it apparently, I say Fidesha. Uh, another thing that came out of Fidesha was, you know, if you're a compliance per person, the Truth and Savings Act, you know, which, uh, you know, made banks um, provide, have more disclosures on, on their savings account rates and things of that nature. Um, then uh, the other thing that the, the Fidesha Act of 1991 um, added was uh, Section 36 to the Federal Deposit Insurance Act or the FDI Act. So Section 36 um, is titled early identification of needed improvements in financial management. So 
um, it essentially required banks to undergo financial audits. And it set the threshold at, in, in section 36, it set the threshold of the greater of whatever the FDIC decides and or $150 million in total assets. Well, the FDIC came along um, and implemented part 363 to implement the FDI Act. And so they set a threshold at $500 million in total assets. So, so the greater of 150 million and 500 million is 500 million. So that was our threshold um, under this new um, part 363. And what, what it does is it required banks that exceeded this threshold to have audited financial statements. It also implements stricter audit independence rules. It uh, implements you know, the need for banks to formalize an audit committee and it, and it um, describes how that, you know, how the composition of that audit committee should be made up of. Um, then it also, with that audit of financial statements on an annual basis, required that management submit to the FDIC um, a management report attesting to its financial reporting, uh, among a few other things that are in that, that report that goes to the FDIC. So that came out with that uh, FIDICIA Act, um, you know, in the early 1990s. And then in the late 2000s, 2009, Part 363 was amended to require banks over 1 billion total assets to attest to its internal controls over financial reporting. So going over a billion, so what can you, what can you expect as, as a bank? You know, three main things that you know, really expand upon you know, the previous rule of crossing over the $500 million mark. Um, the, the increase in regulation comes um, in, in the form of the audit committee composition, how that management assessment looks at the end of each year, and then also um, what does your external audit look like? So I'll dive into that into those three components in a little more detail here to see what, what are the changes from being a bank between 500 and a billion and a bank over a billion in total assets. The audit co committee composition um, under uh, part 363, if you're over 500 million, um, but, less than but less than 1 billion total assets, it says that your audit committee must be made up of outside directors um, but then if you're under a billion, it says uh, the majority must be independent of management. So outside directors and independent, those have two different, those have two different uh, definitions. So an outside director, um, quite simple, is one who not within the last year has been an employee of that bank. So if you weren't a bank within the, or an employee of or an officer of that bank within the last year, you're eligible to be an outside director. To be independent, it's a little little higher bar, a little, little stricter on the, on the rules. And, and these come straight out of the Part 363 ruling. Um, and it provides some examples of, of what would be an independent issue. So uh, the first one you see there, if, if um, one of your directors has 10% or more ownership in the bank, um, it, it's not a, br a bright line in, in the rule, but um, you know, it has that mark in there. And if you're above that, you'd have to provide some documentation as to why, and, you know, you have a significant owner sitting on your audit committee. Um, the second bullet there, if you as the director have been an employee or officer within the last three years, you would not be independent. Um, then if you're immediate family member, so if you're the director and you have a, an immediate family member who was an executive officer within the last year, you would not be independent. Now, if you're a director and you have, um, and say your spouse um, is, is a teller at the bank, you know that that wouldn't be an issue with these rules. And then uh, participation in the preparation of financial statements, um, same deal there. You know, within the last three years, you have to have that three-year uh, kind of cooling off period before you can be considered independent. And so remember, if you're over a billion in total assets, um, everybody on that audit committee has to be independent. Um, just a few more um, considerations on independence um, on that audit committee composition. This net first bullet, there's um, a lot there, but the gist of it is if you were a consultant or advisor receiving services within the last 12 months and received more than 100,000 indirect or indirect compensation, compensation for those services, 
you would not be in independent. So key thing there, consulting and advisory services, uh, more than 100,000 within the tw last 12 months would not be independent. Then if you were an internal or external auditor for the bank within the last three years, or was a partner or an employee of the firm that did the audit, you would also not be independent. So a three year kind of cooling off period there as well to be considered independent. Then just some other, other considerations, you know, um, part 363 has a definition of in immediate family members. And if you're a CPA out there, maybe um, aware of, you know, the AICPA independence rules, um, these are a little bit different as to what's an immediate family member, but here it's a, a little more um, all encompassing, you know, it loops in your spouse, your parents, children, siblings, in-laws, um, and anyone who is living at, at your home. So, so a little more restrictive there on the family member definition. All right, uh, so moving on to the next uh, bullet point, if you remember um, from that uh, original slide that there were three main components that going over a billion, it really kind of changes with the bank. And the, you know, the first one is that audit committee composition. You know, the second one is that internal control over financial reporting. Um, and so I don't know if you remember our opening uh, webinar with Noah Wilcox, but I don't know how relevant this is to what we're talking about. I, I like the quote that he gave uh, during his, um, his opening remarks. And he, and he might've quoted somebody else, but I thought it was a great quote because it said, you know, don't let a good crisis go to waste. And, you know, when I think about that, I think about, you know, these banks that are going over a billion, you know, there's a lot of questions that, that are going, uh, you know, through your minds. And a lot of questions are, are, you know, what, you know, what does this do for our internal control over financial reporting? And, you know, you know, this seems like a big burden, but, you know, you know, with that burden, there's also lays, you know, an opportunity for banks to, you know, take a look at, at your, your processes and, and Noah also alluded to this as well, you know, use this opportunity to evaluate, you know, your processes and, you know, you can find efficiencies, you know, with this Fidesha project. So it, it's also an opportunity, you know, to look at your, take a deep dive and detailed look into, you know, what, you know, what, what are your processes and controls out there in, you know, can you gain some efficiencies through that process? So there's also, you know, there's always a, a silver lining, you know, in some of these, uh, some of these issues. So ICFR, um, two, you know, there's two sides of the coin here. You know, first of all, management has to um, provide an attestation. They have to attest to their internal controls over financial reporting. So they have to do certain procedures and do certain assessments of their internal controls to determine that whether you know it's operating effectively or not. They're in an internal control environment. So this re this is that addition to you know their management report. They have to um, management has to add on a few extra paragraphs to their annual FDIC report um, that will say if their internal controls over financial reporting is operating effectively or not. And essentially the bar there is that you do not want to see any material weaknesses um, in your internal controls over financial reporting. Because if you do have any material weaknesses, then you would not be able to say, say that your ICFR is effective. So you would have a, a modified management report that's going to the FDIC. And that would not, not be a good um, good issue to explain away. You know, the assessment of, of ICFR, you know, it's an as of date. When you're submitting that report, you're saying our internal control, controls are operating effectively as of, you know, December 31, 2020. So it's an as of date, um, which gives you some time throughout that, that period. You know, usually you're, it's your fiscal year when you're doing your testing. You know, you can have, there's, an opportunity to, you know, if you're managing your time right, you can do some testing throughout the year. And if you identify issues throughout the year, you know, if you have enough time um, between then and in your the end of your fiscal year, you can do some remediation over that troubled area, make those make those fixes, and then retest. And then if your retesting passes, then as long as it's good by 1231, um, you're good to go. And then the other side of the coin for internal control over financial reporting is from, from your independent, independent auditor, your external auditor. So your auditor who's auditing your financial statements, you know, also has to attest to the effectiveness of your inter internal controls over financial reporting. So 
a lot of this, you know, is going to be driven off of that documentation that management has put together on its internal control environment and its documentation of key controls. And then also, you know, its conclusions um, and testing of those key controls. The independent auditor, auditor evaluates those, uh, you know, what management came up with, evaluates that documentation, and then also does some independent testing of their own to come up with their own opinion on internal controls over financial reporting at the bank. And same thing there, you know, when the independent auditor um, submits that, you know, issues that report, if there's a material weakness, you know, it would be considered a modified opinion. So not, not a clean opinion. So your goal is to not have any material weaknesses. And, and there's, there's different bars as to, you know, types of, signif of internal control deficiencies, uh, material weakness being the most pervasive. You know, there are, uh, you know, lesser levels of control deficiencies such as significant deficiencies and simple control deficiencies. So, so it doesn't mean you can't um, have any, uh, any errors or any, any issues, but the management and your independent auditor have to make that judgment call if it rises to the level of a material weakness. So on this page, um, we've kind of covered that first bullet and sub bullet. Um, the second bullet, you know, what, you know, what kind of internal control framework do we, do we use? Um, and in part 363, it doesn't specify what um, framework you use, but there's essentially only one that I'm, only one framework that I'm aware of. And <laughs> I think 99.9% .9 of every other institution out there in the world is the internal, internal control integrated framework um, established in 2013 by the Committee of Sponsoring Organizations, um, or COSO. Um, this was an update from their um, original um, framework in 1992. Um, 2013, they, they got together and, and kind of refreshed the internal control um, framework. So the internal controls, you know, over financial reporting. So just to kind of expand upon, you know, what the external auditor's role is, you know, they're supposed to be doing this internal control over financial reporting assessment in conjunction with their audit of, of financial statements. And what that's called, that's called an integrated audit. Um, and so there was a, an auditing standard kind of ruling a few years back that clarified that, you know, your external auditor doing the financial statement audit also has to be the one doing, you know, the ICFR te testing. You can't piecemeal it with one firm doing the financial statement audit and the other, another firm doing the um, ICFR audit. It's gotta be an integrated audit. And then, you know, the third bullet point there is, is kind of significant because if you looked at part 363, it kind of alludes to that um, your financial statement audit can be an opinion on, say, the holding company consolidated report. And then ICFR could just, opinion could just be on the bank only. You know, you could have a mismatch of your reporting entities there. Well, this is not true with the uh, clarification under the auditing standards for integrated audits, um, where your ICFR opinion must match the reporting entity noted in, in management's assessment. So if management issues their FDIC assessment um, on the holding company as a whole, you know, then your external auditor must audit the financial statements of the holding company on a consolidated basis. And then the ICFR opinion also has to be on that consolidated entities. Um, so, so the, in conclusion, you know, ICFR opinion must match that of the management's report. Just some more, more uh, bullet points here on ICFR acquired institutions, you know, in part 363, it does have a paragraph in there that says that, you know, if you have an acquisition during the year that you're first subject to, or I guess in any year that you're subject to the fiducia rules for banks over a billion, you can exclude for that first year um, of that acquisition, you can exclude from management's assessment and the external auditor's report, um, your consideration of that acquired um, institution or that acquired, um, you know, bank or, or subsidiary. So they give you a little, little bit of uh, breathing room there to get your ducks in a row and get those kind of um, integrated with, with, the, with the new organization. Um, another point here to be made is that management, you know, can rely on in the, their internal auditor to perform tests of controls. This can be done internally. Um, you could outsource this to um, an externally sourced um, internal auditor 
uh, to help augment some of the testing and documentation work. Um, usually, typically see you know banks outsourcing you know the initial work of putting together do the documentation and maybe the first year or two of performing the test of controls, and then then you know that allows the bank to kind of maybe beef up their internal audit department and take over at some point. You know, it just all depends on what your what your bank's strategy is as far as you know staffing your internal audit department and the uh, qualifications and and you know amount of time available too because it's a it's a significant un undertaking to uh, kind of manage the fiducia documentation and doing those um, especially initially to put those together in that on an ongoing basis kind of manage the, that process it's a uh, almost a full-time job for for an internal auditor as i mentioned before um, the coso 13 is a framework so who's part of this coso framework you know not too important but you know yeah i was wondering well who's who are these um, sponsoring organizations, so to speak. You know, you got your American Accounting Association, your um, your AICPA, which uh, most of you are familiar with, um, Institute of Internal Auditors, um, Financial Executives International, um, Association for Accountants and Financial Professionals in Business is the last one. And uh, the I Bailey logo, we, this is just part of our slide. We're not really part of this uh, COSO framework uh, committee, so. So ignore the I Bailey logo in the corner. So the COSO framework, uh, you know, this, you know, lays out the, you know, the the framework for uh, an organization's internal control system, and what it does is, um, just like the 1992 um, framework, it has five major components: your control environment, risk assessment, control activities, information and communication, and monitoring activities. So those kind of stay the same, you know, having those five major components of your internal control framework. Uh, but the 2013 uh, modification came out with, uh, you know, 17 kind of sub principles, um, you know, that kind of stem from those five major components. So as you can see there listed, you know, 17 principles, you know, with, uh, you know, what and which component they relate to. So this is the framework that's going to drive you know, your bank's um, internal control testing. Um, and the, I don't know if you've ever seen this, this is kind of a, you know, abstract type of a, a picture here, but but the point of this picture here in this, um, you know, this cube, or, you know, some will call it, like looks like a Rubik's cube. You know, it has your five components, you know, your five layers, you know, so this is your, internal control framework for your organization. And your control framework stems across each of your entities, your divisions, your operating units, and each function. So each function, each operating unit, each division, entity level, et cetera. So, um, so maybe going back to like, you know, which reporting entity, you know, you're gonna include on your, your um, ICFR opinion or your management assessment to the FDIC, are you gonna do it on a holding company consolidated basis? Well then, you know, your holding company would be subject to the ICFR testing and same with your bank. And then also if there's other subsidiaries under the holding company, you know, if you're doing a consolidated report, all of those other, you know, the controls would have to be considered under those, whether they're material or significant or not, you still have to consider them. Um, so if you have other subsidiaries under the holding company, you know, you would have to consider that for your control environment testing. Um, same thing if you have other funct various functions and operating units within the bank. And then one thing um, to note here, you know, you have three different segments here going, you know, the kind of the cross section going this way. You have operations, reporting, and compliance, you know, because you can have a control framework over your operations, your financial reporting, and then also for, you know, which is, you know, a significant part of banks is your regulatory compliance, you know, practice. You know, the thing that uh, Fidesha is primarily concerned with, though, is your reporting, your financial reporting. So the, your Fidesha report doesn't really ex extend to, you know, your normal operations. You know, it doesn't care, you know, how your, you know, how your teller line's operating and, you know, you know, things of that. It cares if there's controls that can impact the financial statements, um, you know, but regulatory compliance, you know, re Reg E and, and some of those other regulations, you know, that's really not tested under Fidesha. It's mainly financial reporting as it relates to your um, GAAP financial statements. 
So what is a, an internal control? Uh, official definition is a process affected by an entity's board of directors or management and other personnel designed to provide reasonable assurance regarding the achievement of objectives. And, and this is kind of a rehash of that cube on the previous page. You know, it talks about effectiveness and efficiency of operations. Um, internal controls also um, includes reliability of financial reporting and then also compliance with laws and regulations. However, we're only concerned with the reliability of financial reporting as it relates to FIDESHA. Now, it's, it's probably important to have controls over other things and to look at efficiencies and um, how your compliance department is operating as well. So what do good internal controls look like? You know, uh, the three main components I think of um, is, are they properly designed to mitigate the risk? Are they properly implemented? And then are they documented? Are they auditable? So that's the main thing. If you could have controls in place, but if there's no documentation to evidence that that control took place, um, your auditor is not going to say either. they can't. They can't just take your word for it. As one of the main um, audit standards that says that you know inquiry alone is is not enough for our um, for our auditing procedures. You typically have to you know you know verify in, um, that that control is taking place by looking at some um, documentation or other evidence of it um, occurring. You know, and you can put uh, controls into three different buckets. Um, and these are situated, organized from, I would say the most effective to the least effective as far as timing of, you know, mitigating or preventing a control. So preventive, just kind of, you know, how it, you know, the title it, um, indicates, you know, are controls that prevent misstatements or anything, you know, an error from even occurring. You know, the top two bullets, I'd say, you know, when we're doing a FIDESHA, test or word um, designing uh, the control matrix, you know, segregation of duties and approvals, authorizations and verification, these are pretty significant in, in what we typically see. You know, we, you'll see that a lot as being important key controls in our documentation. These last four are also relevant as they typically um, relate to IT controls. And IT controls, uh, specifically over you know, user access, you know, disaster re recovery, um, change controls, you know, vendor management, things of that nature, those are also relevant under FIDESHA. So you can't ignore um, the IT aspect of your, of your internal control framework. Um, detective, so this, I'd say this was, would be the second in line as far as its effectiveness of, you know, preventing or, or detecting um, errors. Um, reconciliation, so your cash reconciliations, teller recs, your vault reconciliation, your investment portfolio reconciliation, um, your loan trial balance re reconciliation. A lot of times, those are automatically, you know, um, automatically reconciled with the with the core system. You know, other detective control surprise cash counts. You know, your internal auditor may be doing this on a periodic basis. Um, IT review. Of access, so so an IT exam, um, video surveillance, error reports. So when I think of like error reports, I'm thinking of you know your un, unposted items, um, things that automatically kick something out. Over here on your compensating mitigating controls, you know this will be this will involve having like secondary reviews. You know, maybe having a second signature on a on an official check or on on something else, um, exception reports. So this could be, uh, um, you know, if you're doing an internal audit and you want to say, you know, I want to make, make sure we're, you know, everyone's getting charged some interest rate, you know, and interest on, on loans. So I'm going to do an exception report of all loans with interest rates below, you know, 0.25% and greater than, you know, 20%. Maybe you don't care if it's too high, but you maybe you might care if it's too low. Um, and it could be an indication of something wasn't entered incorrectly. You know, same thing on the deposit side, you can run exception reports there. Um, kind of same in line with those non-post, non-posting reports, you know, that's also a, an opportunity to, to look for any errors. You know, what does this look like in practice? You know, the goal is to provide documentation that supports that controls are present and functioning. So all five components have to be 
uh, present and functioning and all 17 principles have to be addressed as well. So both at the entity wide level and also at the operational functional level. So some entity wide um, control examples, you know, uh, tone at the top, this would be, be, you know, what we commonly refer to as the, the control environment. When we think about the control environment, if you go back and look at those five main components, the first one is, is the control environment. That's the tone at the top that management sets. Um, and that kind of trickles down throughout the organization through expectations that are communicated, you know, the way they operate their, their business um, and, you know, just, you know, what type of uh, policies and things of that nature that, that they affect to the organization. Um, risk assessment, you know, conducting annual risk assessments, you know, it, maybe this is a, you know, how, how the organization drives its internal audit process is through risk assessments, or maybe it's through, you know, maybe it's required by regulation, you know, to look at, you know, liquidity risk or um, interest rate risk, things of that nature. You know, operational or functional level controls, maybe at a branch control, you know, how are new accounts boarded? You know, this would be a control that, you know, you might see in, in your fiducia testing, you know, making sure that new accounts are boarded properly. And there's a segregation of duties that exists between the person setting up the account and the person receiving that first deposit. And then, you know, loan, loan origination, this is also a common, you know, control that we, we see at, at banks under fiducia, you know, are, how are new loans boarded in the system? Um, and is there a check back control, you know, that someone's verifying that the original documents, the original loan matches what's what actually got set up in the system. And is there a segregation of duties between the person boarding the loan and the person performing the check back? And then the ultimate question is, you know, was there documentation of that occurring? Because if there's no documentation, you know, then both from, you know, if you're testing it internally for management's assessment purposes or from your external auditors um, benefit, you know, they're going to consider that an exception. You know, just some, I uh, want to talk about, you know, you know, what, what are some key elements of this documentation? You know, what, what do we need? You know, what does it look like? Um, you know, typically what we'll see is that there's an overall document summarizing the applicable financial statement areas. Um, we, you know, when we're doing our um, design assistance, implementation consulting assistance for institutions, you know, we'll, we'll use what we call a financial statement map document. And this is a document that ties in um, a risk assessment that's done and the financial statements and dollar amounts on their balance sheet and income statement and and doc, use that documentation again to tie in what we think are the most significant areas of the bank that we need to look at controls under. So it's going to identify, you know, what areas were tested, you know, because you don't have to test everything if you if you're doing a risk assessment, you know, everything's risk based these days. So if you want to do a risk based approach, that's usually the most efficient in my my opinion. So doing an, a risk based approach, looking at the most significant areas, highest risk um, areas where there's a lot of transactions going on, you know, there's high dollar amounts, there's that significant estimates involved, amounts that are material to the financial statements. You're looking at those areas. Um, along with your information technology, um, you're looking at those as to uh, you know which areas you're gonna you're gonna test. So that's on your overall documentation. It's kind of linking together, you know, your financial statements, um, your key controls tested, and then you, know, you also want to have some documentation of you know if, if there's any deficiency yet, deficiencies identified, um, in a way to link that to your your documentation of of testing. Um, the second bullet point there, you know, your documentation of understanding of the process. Uh, we typically, you know, we would think of these call we call them, you know, narratives. You know, we typically see them being done in a, in a word document, and it's just a narrative of, of say, you know, commercial loan lending area. You know, what's what's the uh, process of originating a loan? Do you have loan policies? You know, how does a loan get um, originated? You know, and funded? You know, how do you receive payments? You know, how do you reconcile the loan balances? Um, you know, how, you know, the boarding process, I talked about that as an example. So this is where you would document, you know, that, that process. Um, and within that process, there are going to be key controls that you're going to be able to pull out of that narrative. So out of that documentation of understanding, you're pulling out key controls 
and you're summarizing those key controls on what I, I typically see them being referred to as con control matrices. So you'd have a control matrix, um, typically see this done on a Excel spreadsheet, you know, lists out uh, the key controls. Uh, Some place will put all the controls on there and then identify key controls, or you can just have key controls on there. And then that, that kind of links back to your documentation of understanding or your narrative. And then from there, your control matrix should link to some documentation of testing of those key controls. Um, and then also your conclusions. You know, other items to, to consider, you know, on timing, you know, I get this, been getting this question a lot more recently, um, you know, as I know at the beginning of the, this presentation is, and kind of the common theme is, is growth in these financial institutions. And the growth is pushing a lot of these bank, banks closer to that billion dollar mark and some of them closer than they had anticipated. So how far in advance do you really need to go before what I would say going, going live? And so the judgment and just to, and I don't know if I've covered this yet, but under Fidesha, you know, it's kind of the same rule as going crossing over the $500 million mark um, as it is for a billion. But, you know, the total asset um, threshold is based on your beginning of your total assets. Now the FDIC, a couple of weeks ago came out with an interim final rule that provides some, some relief to certain institutions. If you experience growth during 2020, you can go off of your 1231-19 total assets for your 2021 um, fiscal year for determining compliance with FIDESHA. Um, so I'll touch on that here in a little bit, um, provide a little bit of color what I'm seeing on, on that rule. Um, but you know, we typically recommend starting at least you know, 12 months, you know, 12 to 24 months before going live. When I say going live, so if you're supposed to be Fidesha client compliant by the end of 2022, you know, you're going to be doing some live testing in, throughout 2022. Um, so 12 months before 2022 would be, I would say, the beginning of 2021 or the end of 2020. 2020. Um, so you're looking at um, 2000 and, you know, the beginning of 2020 um, through the end, you know, those 12, 12, 24 months before going live. So you'd want a year or two ahead of time to get that documentation in order because it does take some time to go through the whole, whole bank. Um, and it's kind of, it's, it's a kind of a, you know, I, you know, it's kind of a, you know, eye opener for a lot of, a lot of banks and, and the people to bank that don't understand, you know, what the, you know, how much, how much of an undertaking this is to become Fidesha compliant and get that documentation in order. Um, but, you know, in the second bullet point there, you know, implementation, you know, you can do it, you can outsource it to a, to a firm, come in and help you put together that documentation, put together those control matrices, you know, maybe do some testing and, maybe, and then maybe go through the first, first few years or maybe, you know, it, um, on an ongoing basis, you know, doing the, the live testing. Um, you could do a co-sourcing arrangement where maybe maybe internally you can do some of the control testing, but you can't do all of it. Um, or you can uh, do it all in-house. You don't have to outsource it at all. So so there's a number of ways to go about it. You know, whatever, whatever you know, fits best with your institution. I would comment that being on both sides of the coin, um, you know, being the external auditor, and then also being the consultant, you know, I, I would say outsourcing is probably the, the smoother path um, just because you get access to a little more, you know, experience and, and resources to kind of get, get that done. Um, oftentimes banks underestimate how, how much time it takes to put that documentation together. And if you have a small internal audit department, it, it, uh, it would be a lot of work for just one person or even a couple of people to, to take on in addition to the, their normal internal audit. Um, schedule. We recommend, you know, going through, you know, walking through those key controls before, before you're doing live testing. You know, that's why I say 12 to 24 months before going live, because in that, that year before you go live, you want to um, get to a point where you have your documentation in order and you can kind of kick the tires on, on those key controls and identify any, any initial weaknesses, uh, things like that, where, you know, you know, I mentioned, you know, documentation is a key, is the, the critical thing there, you know, you know, maybe the control is working, but there's no documentation of it. And that's typ typically what we see as, as a common issue, you know, when you're starting to kind of walk through, 
these key control testing, the first thing that usually comes to, comes comes about and comes to the surface is, you know, just a lack of documentation of of these key controls. So that's that's an issue. So, but there is time if you still do it, you know, the year before going live or even in the beginning part of that live fiscal year, you still have time. You know, management does take control for that, um, take responsibility for the controls. But um, like I said before, you know, internal audit we usually see as being kind of the quarterback of that of that process. You know, and, and another thing I am to consider, you know, I would recommend, you know, including your external auditor throughout that process, you know, make sure they're okay with the, um, the narratives and the documentation as it's um, getting put together, you know, do they, you know, agree with, you know, key controls that have been identified and, and things of that, that nature. So there's no, there aren't any, you know, surprises when you get to the end um, of that first year when you're under Fidesha. Um, you know, going back to that, uh, the total assets I mentioned before, you know, FDIC came out with an interim final rule and I don't, I, I dropped off the regulatory panel, you know, before they really, they completed and I, I didn't, you know, I hope that question got asked, but I wasn't there um, to hear the response. I would assume uh, Mr. LaPierre would have taken that being from the FDIC, but they, they, you know, they came out with an FDIC interim rule. Um, saying that, you know, if, if you, you know, if your total assets cross that threshold, whether it's 500 million or a billion in 2020, you could actually, you know, you could base your, for in, so if, if you were to go over in 2020, that means at the end of 2021, um, you would have to be compliant with that new, new threshold. So if you went over a billion, you'd have to be, have your ICFR um, tested and, opined on by then 2021 um, because you crossed over in 2020 so your beginning of your assets of 2021 would be over a billion well the FDIC interim rule says that you can take the you can take either that your beginning of your 2021 fiscal year assets or your 123119 um, total assets so if your 123119 total assets were below the billion dollar mark you know the way I'm, I'm Many of us are interpreting that rule is that you can wait an extra year on your, you know, essentially buying you an extra year for your um, FIDESHA compliance. So then you wouldn't have to, you would have to, um, you wouldn't have to do that until 2022. So buy, buy some of the organizations out there an extra year. And it's pretty broad in general as to the reasoning for crossing over, except it does have a carve out saying that, you know, the FDIC does reserve the right, um, you know, to, you know, if there's growth due to an acquisition, if you had an acquisition that puts you over, you know, they reserve the right to make you um, comply with one or more of um, the requirements in part 363. So, so still not hundred percent sure. And, and maybe they touched on it in, in the regulatory panel and I didn't catch it, um, but um, this is a, a point of contention for, for some as you know, it, it's, it seems to pro provide a little bit of wiggle room, um, but, but it'll be, remain to be seen if, if, that's, um, if that's a hard line that if you had an acquisition that puts you over, then you for sure have to be compliant you know, by 2021, or you can take that same relief as, as everyone else. And not, I'm assuming it's not going to be a bright line, yes or no uh, type answer on that one. So, so I think that judgment's going to have to come from the institution. Management's going to have to make that call. Um, whether whether they're consulting with their examiner or, or with the FDIC um, and getting subtype of uh, um, concurrence on that. So so, but uh, good good news though for for most that um, we're maybe approaching the billion dollar mark. Um, it's kind of unclear if if uh, if you know because there's a five hundred million dollar threshold for the Federal Reserve. Uh, you know, so if if you're going over five hundred million, uh, it seems like the the Federal Reserve had not come out and, and given that same relief. So, so it might be a different story on the $500 million um, threshold. You know, just some other um, considerations on best practices on, on documenting, you know, your internal controls. You know, it should be revisited with each major organizational change. You know, your operations, your staffing, you get new technology, you get a new core system. You should kind of refresh that documentation when you have, you know, major changes um, going on at the organization, you know, for, 
you know, as mentioned before, for acquired institution, you can't, they give you that first year, you know, kind of get things aligned, you know, before you have to include that acquire organization in your um, ICFR testing. Um, and it should reflect, you know, changes made since the last revision, you know, best practices to have your documentation electronic, um, searchable and, and accessible. All right, with that, I think that's the end of my slide deck here. Well, um, if you have any questions as you, you know, think about it later on um, during your, maybe you're going to have your own happy hour after, after this, or if you're going back to work, if you have questions or, or comments, please feel free to reach out to myself. If you have something for Brett, you know, you can send those to me or, or him and we can get him those questions as well. But, but if not, I just want to thank everyone for, for joining us today. We're publishing recordings of many of our sessions from our five-part series. You can visit our website at idbailey.com backslash bank seminar to view the recorded sessions. Um, other than that, um, have a great rest of your day. Thank you.